wish you a Shabbat Shalom and a welcome to this afternoon to reflect on the Jews at Williams. Uh, we'll have uh, an opportunity to hear from uh, some people who know uh, a lot about that and uh, from personal experience and from uh, quite wondrous research. Uh, but I think I would, most important uh, for us to begin this afternoon, let me just uh, introduce um, uh, myself. I'm Cantor Bob Scher, the Jewish chaplain for Williams College. And I'm uh, sitting next to former president Francis Oakley uh, of Williams College and uh, uh, Dr. Ben Wergaft, who is uh, uh, the writer whose work that we're uh, discussing today. And to formally begin the program, uh, let me call on uh, President Adam Falk for his greetings. So welcome to, to everyone to, ooh, I guess you can hear it. Welcome to everyone to uh, what I think is going to be an extraordinary discussion over the next hour. Um, I just had a few thoughts that, that offer. Um, this is a big deal. This book and the work it represents and the stories that it represent are a big deal for this college. And um, the, the story here is important now and it's important in understanding how we ought to be who we are now. It's, um, of course, it's, it's a number of things, as all good history is. It's a specific window into a specific subject, which is the evolving state of Jewish life here at Williams. And that specific subject is one, if you'll indulge me, of just a one minute of, of personal reminiscence that, that means a lot to me and my family. Is it touches on a, a bit of my own family history. My father was a refugee, a Jewish refugee from Germany. Uh, who left in 1933, a college professor, came to England uh, and went to Oxford, got another degree and taught at Oxford uh, during the war. And after the war, when the real Dons returned, uh, a Jewish-German refugee was not going to stay at Oxford and uh, made his way, um, he made his way eventually to, to uh, Australia and then to the States. But the st I heard many stories about that period, 19, he was there from the early 30s until the late 40s, and kind of the ways in which Jews at Oxford in that period were and were not assimilated, accepted, uh, how despite what, whatever accomplishment, and I think high accomplishment they might have, they were kept at the same time on the outside in ways that were, I think, clung to very strongly by the society at the time. And so that, that dance between acceptance and, um, and uh, uh, alienation was one that, that you know, informed a lot of his understanding of his time there. He was very loyal to England and to Oxford. He remained a British subject until his death and uh, I think felt saved by the Nazis. But uh, he wrote one collected book of essays when he was 80 years old. He collected his essays and I think the greatest moment of his life as a professional was when the Times Literary Supplement reviewed the book very positively and identified him as an English philosopher. <laughs> and I think there's a lot in there, in that, in that story about, about that journey. So I think it's a wonderful story that's, that's deeply important for its own right, uh, the story that's in this book. But of course, it's also part of a larger story of how Williams has evolved, and it illuminates that, that, uh, that evolution of many uh, populations of folks who have come to the college first in provisional and liminal ways and then have moved as much as anyone else to the center, uh, African Americans, Catholics, Jews, and so forth. Um, we've been reflecting on that here at Williams. If uh, We had a program in the spring, Daring Change, which reflected, I think, in really interesting ways on Jack Sawyer's presidency and the kinds of social changes that, uh, that, that took place then that made the college what it is now and are of course reflected uh, in, in wonderful ways in this history here. So this is an important story and this is right now the publication of this book is an important moment and I want to give special thanks to all of those who made it possible for us to be here and particularly to Ben Ruhrgraft who, uh, you know, writing history isn't easy. I have historians in my family and it's one thing to write history when the people are all long gone it's another thing to write history when everyone is there to tell you exactly uh, what happened. And uh, it's probably very exciting. And weaving a single narrative out of the enormous diversity of stories that are really what happened is, uh, I think, the great challenge of the historian. 
And uh, you've done it marvelously. And you have weaved an extraordinary story. Thank you for that. So with that, uh, let me turn it back over to Cantor Scheer and what I think will be a wonderful panel. Thank you all for being here. So we're going to hear from uh, former President Frank Oakley and, uh, and then proceed to Ben and uh, following their presentations, then we'll have a chance to widen the conversation for your, uh, your thoughts uh, as well this afternoon. But first, uh, President Oakley. Thank you, Bob. Uh, you can hear me, ladies and gentlemen, at the back. Uh, um, it's my, it is. Yeah. It's my task to add to the diversity of stories that, <laughs> uh, that, that Ben doesn't have to cope with now. But I think, you know, talking about my job, I take it, of Bob's instructions, are to talk a bit about, throw some light on the decision to build a Jewish religious center here on campus. Um, culminating in a very joyous celebratory dedication uh, service, gosh, over 20 years ago now. It's, it's remarkable. And I, it, the task is a bit, I think, but some, some analogy to dropping a pebble in a pond. You know, the immediate ripples are clear, well-formed, no problem of interpretation, stage one or context one. Then as they spread out, encompassing more territory, they're still clear enough, but a bit more difficult. And then the third context, or third stage, when they hit the banks and generate counter ripples, the business of decoding what's going on becomes a little more tricky. Uh, so let me follow that pattern, one, two, three. Stage one, or context one. Um, the reason, there are good, practical, clear reasons for building a Jewish religious center here on campus, and they were essentially religious. Um, we have in town a whole slew of, of, of Christian denominational churches, but we still have non-denominational Christian worship space in Thompson Memorial Chapel built long ago. There are no temples, no synagogues in Williamstown. The college had made available several decades ago a space for worship, the Cuskin Room, uh, situated not in symbolically good territory. It was underneath the college chapel. <laughs> it functioned, in fact, pretty well, I think. I can remember one truly joyous service when a, a, a new Torah had been donated uh, to the Jewish Religious Association. It was a, a wonderful occasion. But by the mid-80s, both the number of Jewish students was growing slowly, but the intensity of religious observance was probably growing a little more rapidly than that. We're too small a place to attract the help, help from the Hillel organization. And my colleagues and I, and one is sitting right in front of me, Neil Graboy sitting next to Bernie Shaman, Neil who was provost at the time. We talked a lot about this, and we decided it was up to the college to do something about it. It wasn't uh, as simple an issue, it turned out, uh, as one had imagined, that we encountered misgivings uh, both among the uh, uh, Jewish alumni population at large and among the five Jewish trustees on the board at that time. Well, wonderfully supportive people, so this was not a dramatic clash of wills or anything of that sort, but, but they were worried. And the worry, there were several levels of worry. I'll pick just one, because it was the clearest. They had been in their day, and in all of their cases, it was fraternity days. They had been student leaders on campus. And they had been staunchly opposed to the idea of, of adding a Jewish fraternity to the Williams constellation of exclusive, exclusivities uh, that then existed. 
they were nervous or worried that this might be a sort of fraternity. And they had to be convinced um, that what we had in mind was a religious facility. When they were convinced of that, misgivings more or less evaporated. We were able to fold in the project. It was not enormously expensive, but to fold it into the third century campaign, our bicentennial fund drive, and we opened in 1990. So that's stage one. It's not, that's not very complicated, I think. Stage two, or context two, the ripples are going further out. There's more stuff to, to deal with speaks less to the, or not as much to the Jewish community on campus as to the health and vibrancy of the campus community at large. You know, colleges and universities are very complicated things, but at the heart, they're not that complicated. Three things, I think, are absolutely essential. One, the nature and quality of the students admitted. Two, the nature and quality of the faculty you can recruit and hold on to, and the nature and quality of what happens when you bring those two groups together on the field of pedagogic battle. Um, <laughs> our concern in, in this context spoke to the nature and quality of the student body. It was pretty clear that we, in common with all the northern New England liberal arts colleges, were really not attracting the talented Jewish students from the great schools of the metropolitan areas from, from New York, Boston, Philadelphia, in the numbers that, that we should. And we analyzed all of that, and it, not for the first time. But one thing seemed reasonably clear, that all of our institutions had in the past and, uh, uh, traditions or histories of anti-Semitism, all of these old institutions. That, I think, was gone by mid-'80s, except maybe peripheral subtleties that people like me would miss. But perception beyond the campus was trumping the realities. It seemed pretty clear that Jew some Jewish families felt that their sons and daughters would not be truly welcome at a place like this. And we, we, we had to get rid of that perception. And, and one, in a clear, dramatic, institutional commitment, building the Jewish Religious Center spoke to that. I think probably reasonably su successfully. So that speaks to the health and vibrancy of the college community at large. The third context or stage where the ripples are all mixing up with each other, a little harder. And it speaks to the nation and the extraordinary transformations this nation has gone through in the last 40, 50 years, particularly ethnically, racially, culturally. Between 1980 and 1990, 1980, the, the two censuses, national censuses, 1980, the minority population here was 20%. 1990, it was, it was 25. That's an extraordinary increase in that time. And I remember one commentator commenting, he said, it's extraordinary and exciting. We're on our way to becoming the first universal nation in the world. I think he was right. I think that's an extraordinary and noble thing, and I felt passionately and feel passionately that our colleges and universities have a very important role to play in helping, facilitating that complex transition which is fraught with tension and upheaval. Um, Williams had committed itself in the early to mid-60s to diversifying its student body. By 1985, our minority population was about 12.5%. We accelerated across the next few years, particularly because the whole Latino population was coming online, and we doubled that to 25% by 1990. 
by somewhere around 92 to 93, um, that's f fairly dramatic. It was fraught with tension on campus, one sort or another. But a very important thing, I think, for us to be doing. You know, Martin Luther King, evoking his, his vision of the beloved community of inclusion, spoke, and he spoke in language redolent of Tana Cantora, of a future, a future in which the valleys would be exalted and the mountains brought low, the rough ways plain and the crooked ways straight, a future in which it would be possible at long last to hew out of the mountain of despair a precious stone of hope. His words, not mine. I wish I could have come up with anything like that. His words, not mine. Now, I may have been naive. Um, college presidents are capable of being naive. Adam, I should say, in, in the days gone by, that, <laughs> that was possible. I may have been naive, but it was my deep wish that the opening of the Jewish Religious Center would speak to issues beyond the immediate ones I've just mentioned, that it would speak and render visible the depth of the college's aspiration to become a community of inclusion and such a community of hope. That I truly believe. I truly believe that it should be. I truly believe that it must be. And I'll stop with that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Frank. Um, and I think, um, Ben, if you'll forgive me, rather than reviewing your, your biography, um, because I see a lot of people carrying books and that's available there, um, I think I'll, I'll simply ask you to um, tell us what you learned. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Witty response coming online. Um, <laughs> what I've learned within the last five to seven minutes is that the strangest experience that this historian has ever had is sitting next to one of the subjects about whom he's written, <laughs> speaking, <laughs> continuing to narrate their own story. And um, that's something to which one can never truly do justice. And um, it's arguably more for the psychoanalyst's couch than for a proceeding like, like ours. Um, it, the most pleasant task in writing this book is really thanking those who made it possible. And I want to start by doing that again today. Um, Sigmund Balka was instrumental in bringing the project into being. And it was Rob White, my primary point of contact at Williams, who believed me when I said that there might be a book in the subject. Now, uh, I'm sure many of you uh, had some feeling when hearing, on hearing about the book. Um, a book about Jewish life at Williams, a book about Jewish history at Williams. It must be how, how many pages long? <laughs> <laughs> Five, ten. Five. But the joke I would tell uh, when I was giving talks about the book is that every time somebody makes that joke, the book grows by that number of pages because more people, more voices would come out of the woodwork wanting to be heard. That was a precious opportunity and one that it was very difficult to do justice to one of the tasks of the historian in a project like this, so dependent on oral history, so dependent on living voices, is to hmm, uh, reflect back some of the most common narratives and some of the most commonly voiced narratives while trying to raise questions that would seem relevant to as many life stories as possible. Um, now, what, what made it possible to do that? Without Sylvia Kennick Brown in the William College archives, and without her colleagues, this work would simply have been impossible. Um, I owe them all a debt. And I need to mention that many of the interviews that I used in writing this book were originally conducted by Carrie Green and by a number of past Williams students in the course of several, I, I believe, religion department courses that involved oral histories about 
Williams College's Jewish past. Um, Karen Franklin, a Jewish genealogist, contributed her own archival work to the project. And, um, and, and Bob Scher helped me to understand contemporary Jewish life at Williams, which as a, someone from outside of the Williams family, shall we say, I needed to be brought into. Um, less specifically, but no less warmly, I do want to thank everyone who came forward to speak with me in the course of the project, um, both here on campus and from Los Angeles to Berkeley to Chicago to New York to my native Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm, I'm now in the process of looking back uh, on a published volume which has already received some appreciative, and I should add, some critical readings. And I've thought a little bit about the purposes which I think books like this might be able to serve. Um, obviously, members of the Williams community have their own investments in this story. People have their own understandings of what Williams meant and continues to mean to them. Um, and of course, as you know, Williams has a, a especially supportive and involved alumni network. My real hope is that this book might draw us out of some of our pre-established sets of concerns and pre-established ideas about what the Jewish presence at Williams has been about and perhaps give us something new to reflect upon. Um, that's why I wrote the book as I did, emphasizing the decades before the 1950s uh, as much as the decades after, and trying to illustrate why the history of admissions decisions at Williams and ingrained prejudice at Williams played out differently than, say, the histories of those same things did at Columbia or Princeton or Harvard. Um, I wanted to show that prejudice at Williams was not, in fact, um, a kind of active anti-Semitism that was part of the very air people breathed, but rather that there were elements of prejudice, um, often invisible and therefore most effective, in the very social connections that brought young men to Williams in the first place. The story was not about mm, on-campus pogroms, obviously, but rather about that term that has taken on a very specific contemporary valence, namely the social network. And in more contemporary terms, I think that my story is about the, the persistent importance of social networks in our own time and the need to be conscious of the relationship between college and Amer in America, or rather college and class status in American life as early as the 1870s and as late as 2013. Um, and I, I, I should add that um, what Frank is narrating is in some sense a response to history already present in the book itself, right? There's a sense in which the founding of the Jewish Religious Center is a very conscious attempt to respond to Jewish, to, to, excuse me, to William's uh, Jewish history. What I reflected upon in the book, especially in the latter moments of the book, is how strange that is and how interesting, and in some dimension, how inspiring. Many institutions have problematic histories. In fact, almost all American institutions have some measure of problematic history. Um, what it means to really engage with that, to try to come to terms with the way one's student body has been constituted, continues to be constituted, to try to change that with an eye towards things as meritorious as social justice is, I think, a very complicated, difficult, and, and noble effort. Um, if I rendered it in somewhat more complex terms than those in my chapter on the establishment of the JRC, um, I'd want readers to understand as well that what the book treats first and foremost is the very kind of prejudice that shaped the Jewish pres presence at Williams in the early decades, so the 1870s through the 1940s. Um, and uh, maybe in closing, if I have time, I do have a little time, I'll read you a short excerpt of the introduction to the book. Um, this is maybe my favorite submission ever to a campus literary magazine. Um, in 1904, a Jewish peddler and tailor named Abraham Epstein 
arrived in Williamstown, Massachusetts, to set up shop in the Purple Valley and try his luck. He set out a sign reading, Abe Epstein, clothes cashed, tailoring done. And he alarmed the locals with his business practices, which included the unusual request that students pay for his services up front in cash, rather than by establishing a line of credit that they might pay back just before graduation weekend, if they remembered to. Yeah. To drum up business, Abe walked from dormitory to dormitory asking students if they needed clothes mended or buying suits of clothes that he could then resell later. Some unkind students mocked him for his old world appearance and manner, or even threw ashes they had taken from the stoves used to heat their rooms. Epstein bore this abuse somewhat stoically, uh, saying in response only, my people were not so well treated in Egypt. No. Eventually, as the students became used to old Abe, the abuse slowed to a triple, and Abe's cash on the barrel had business practices helped him to prosper, and he began to buy property on Spring Street, establishing a small business empire and lasting wealth for his wife and children. His sons eventually took over the family business, and Abe actually became a legendary figure for generations of William students in the way that individuals in small college towns can acquire disproportionate fame or notoriety. He was the wandering Jew who had settled down to become their tailor, for many, the first Jew they had ever met. Um, now, what I just read, this tale, is not history but myth. It was a student's literary flight of fancy, published as a short story in, in the Williams College Literary Quarterly Sketch in 1934 but it dramatized the life of a real Williamstown Abraham, uh, Abraham Rudnick, who established his business on Spring Street, just like his fictional counterpart. Rudnick was an immigrant, part of the flood of migration that changed the face of American Jewry between 1880 and 1920, but he was far from the first Jew in Williamstown. Jews had been present on the Williams campus for decades when he turned up. The first Jews associated with Williams College were students matriculating in the early 1870s um, and graduating in, in 1876 and 1878, uh, respectively. You know, these were Emmanuel Cohen and Charles Gross. Uh, their stories are treated in the introduction. Uh, now, I think that one of the best ways to know a community is through its myths. Um, in the sketch story, Williams College is populated by students who know Jews only through stereotype. For them, Jews are walking anachronisms, pieces of an Eastern Europe that, that once was, or perhaps never was. Um, and in keeping with their stereotypes, this Rudnick slash Epstein character even interprets the geographic features of New England in the, in the short story by comparing them to the mountains and rivers of Canaan using the Bible as a guidebook by which to navigate Western Massachusetts. The story conveys just how foreign many Jews seemed to the students and faculty populating Williams College during the last decades of the 19th century and the first decades of the 20th. But the fact that the story says nothing about the more Americanized Jews uh, who had already passed through Williams as students speaks volumes to me as a historian. It attests the success of a pattern of camouflage, for it was the ability to not seem like old Abe that characterized early Jewish life at Williams. And I'm happy to answer more questions about early Jewish life at Williams to talk more about the rest of the book, and maybe most importantly, and I'll end on this note, to hear your stories and your ideas about how Williams Jewish history might be represented. Thank you. So I will play uh, gatekeeper at this point uh, and uh, respond to you as you uh, raise your hands and, and we'll uh, widen the discussion. What a bashful group, yes. And, but you'll have to speak up with your outside voice. <laughs> Why, Williams, did you look at a, several schools to write this kind of history? Uh, President Oakley indicated there were, it was typical of many 
Northern Liberal Schools. Why Williams? Why Williams? Williams was asking. <laughs> and, and I was alluding to this in my, my comment when I was talking about what it means for an institution to grapple with its history. Um, Williams grappled with its history in the establishment of the Jewish Religious Center in ways that I think are complicated. Williams continues to do so. I take this as a sign of institutional maturity. Now, uh, in answer to, your, to, I think, the force of your question, given world enough and time, it would have been extremely interesting to compare a number of slightly similar and slightly different schools. Um, answering the question of why Amherst got more Jews, I think is really important. There seemed to be some kind of invisible line yeah. through Massachusetts that those from New York didn't cross, right? Um, one wants to know why, right? Um, looking at some of the main colleges would be very interesting. Looking at schools elsewhere um, in a somewhat narcissistic vein for me to look at Swarthmore would have been fascinating. Uh, to what degree did Quaker schools welcome Jews? To what degree were they still exclusive, right? Yes. Uh, my name is Alan Stern, class of 67. My father was Robert Stern, uh, class of 1929, so he was here from 1925 to 1929, and he went on to Harvard Law School after that, became a very distinguished lawyer in the Department of Justice. Uh, but I remember him telling me that his social experience here, and I haven't read your book yet, I'm looking forward to it, was uh, miserable to say the least. It was the Garfield Club uh, that he mentioned because he was not allowed to join a fraternity. And once he reached Harvard Law School, it was much more equal, much more accepting. Uh, and I think it's a tribute to him that he did not bear a grudge against Williams for the rest of his life. He sent two of his sons there and supported him financially for the rest of his life, but uh, he very well could have chosen not to have done that. Story about age, I'm kind of touchy. My name is Ralph Eckstein. I was here in the late 50s, and I went door to door with surplus sweaters from Revere Sportswear that were shipped up to me by an aunt, selling as the Jewish peddler and then I was so stationary too, and I did very well there caressing me. It's a year ahead of me. It me a little bit. But I went door to door, and on the rushing weekends, I wore one of my fancy sweaters instead of a blue blazer. There were three fellows not accepted the fraternity at the end. Uh, after the only African American fellow who was uh, very effeminate and would sing. German opera in a falsetto voice as he went across the board, so it was just out of the norm. And myself and my junior advisor said to me, Ralph, why did you wear those sweaters? And I thought, well, they obviously it wasn't acceptable. I said, well, that's their problem. And interestingly, it never occurred to me that anything was wrong. I went on a year later, got into and had a very happy life. I was a scholarship student, I had four jobs. And my <clears throat> recollection of William is always one of such gratitude. A number of years ago, Ben Stein published a commentary in the New York Times entitled On Gratitude. And his father was a student in the 30s here, working in the kitchen with the garbage and doing the floors, which is exactly what I did at Fry City. When he asked his father if he resented or envied the other students who had money and time and such, and he looked at it incredulously and said, envy? I spent four years with gratitude in my heart, which is exactly what I left the Williams with. The other interesting thing about my experience was I sang in the college choir, the high fiscal choir. I was a Jew's <laughs> Today when I came, I went to the choir chapel and I sang a hymn at the altar where I stood and looked and stood next to the mountain with the king and where I had William Sloan Coffin as my life's inspiration. I was so fortunate to be here and my experience as an active Jewish adult in Williams revolves around the chapel.
So, um, my name is Lloyd Constantine, and um, I wanted to say two things. One, I wanted to thank Ben for the book. Um, I think it's just an extraordinary book. Um, it's one of those things that, you know, as a Jew at Williams, as a, as a student thinking about coming to Williams, um, I, knew, I knew exactly, I know exactly what was going on. I knew exactly the ways in which Williams had a history of anti-Semitism, and I thought I knew everything about it. And uh, when I shared my thoughts about this with my Jewish friends at Williams then and since, we all knew exactly the deal. And of course, we didn't. And I didn't until I read this book. So it explains something that I think a lot of us thought we really fully understood, but we really uh, didn't understand, and I think that's great. I think, and I think also, it was great that we got a non-Williams person to write the book. Yeah. I remember all of the, you know, hemming and hawing and and worry around the time that John Chandler became president of Williams because he hadn't gone to Williams. I remember how God, I mean, you know, what I mean, I remember that. Well, he taught here for. 90 years, but you know, he had to gone to Williams, and I remember all of that. And then, you know, when the unmentionable happened, you know, we get a series of people you know, who had neither taught nor, you know, gone to Williams, like President Paul. Um, and the confidence that the institution now has to get people like that. To get people like uh, you know President Oakley and, and President Payne and President Falk and President Chandler and Ben Workaf, the great scholar, to do this, I think is uh, is part of the growing maturity of the institution. So I just wanted to thank you for just doing a absolutely spectacular job. And just one other thing, uh, in, in response to the question about why Williams, and I, I knew the answer to, to, to that, but I found that it also illuminated. Uh, Yale, Harvard, Oxford, <laughs> it, it illuminated all of those things. Uh, uh, and it, it explained something well beyond uh, the Purple Valley. So thank you for that as well. Uh, my name is Neil Boyd. I didn't go to Williams, but I spent more time here than most people have. <laughs> say a few words, uh, partly uh, generated by your reference to Swarthmore, because I did go to Swarthmore. Mm -hmm. And I remember in the early 50s showing up to Swarthmore to play college, uh, thinking that I would be a liberal figure at best. And when I came to Williams in 1963 as a member of the faculty, that had evanesced, and I had no sense whatsoever as a member of the faculty, uh, that uh, the events we counted in a book like The Chosen, which talks about admissions and all the young Princeton and uh, the sorts of things that probably uh, existed in some less dramatic way here. Uh, but the comparisons were so interesting, and the, especially so, I think, when I was asked to be dean of the college in 1970. Uh, and even then, I never had a sense that, that my Jewish background was at all relevant uh, to, to being an administrator. Uh, I was an administrator when the Husky Room was created, and Frank's uh, comments uh, about uh, the symbolism of being an amazing uh, for the Jewish uh, society, Jewish Association, was rather dramatic. But then that too disappeared, and the, and the sense. Uh, that uh, the new uh, Jewish Religious Center was going to be a, a reality. Uh, just was an icing uh, on the cake. Uh, I, I just wanted to tell one story, and it may be uh, both indicative of, of Williams and of some of the people who came. And it may be somewhat apocryphal, but I doubt A uh, junior advisor who was one of the people who lived with with students and help them uh, develop their connections uh, to their studies and to the school, told me the story about Stephen Sondheim. 
and I don't know whether it's uh, it's come your way, uh, and I don't even know whether it's been. But I'll tell it anyway, since he's an uh, important and dramatic figure. Uh, at the time, uh, there were maybe 12, 30, something on that order, 50, and Stephen Sondheim had applied all, and had been rejected by <coughs> all. And he went to his JA, uh, who was later a trustee here, and said, Andy, I applied to 15 attorneys, and not one of them me. What's going on? And Andy said, well, you're a Jew. And Stephen Sondheim said, respond to that very briefly um, and thank you for that that was that was wonderful um, I um, had many moments in writing the book when I looked at myself in the mirror and I thought to what extent is this book about Jewish history at Williams and to what extent is it about Frank Oakley right <laughs> um, um, if you don't mind my saying so it, 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 I, I, th I think that the, the lens through which we view this history is enormously important and I kept asking myself uh, how many I could have, whose who's had become dominant, whose were receding, um, how to distill something that was more like my voice in that sort of chorus of voices was enormously challenging. And I think that the narratives that you're presenting bring out that, that sense of ambiguity. Thank you. 
listen to people talk about their experience, you will, you will understand better your own <coughs> and why things work out the way they did. Uh, one of the problems I've always had is the use of the word Jewish community as if it was a monolith. I uh, was always a sort of when Nelson Rockefeller would run for election in New York, go down to Coney Island, put on a yarmulke, and the Jewish community was sewn up. Uh, and I, I likewise disturbed when, when uh, Abraham Foxman, a lovely man, would write a letter to the Times that he was speaking for everybody, including me. And I, I never met the man, I really don't know. And somewhat disturbed as well to see my freshman year roommate at Williams quoted extensively in the book with no chance of rebuttal. Because uh, his experience was not mine. I, uh, I was here in the uh, early 50s. And uh, I once had to tell him, he doesn't believe it, that uh, very, very simply that he did not have a monopoly on being a Jew at Williams. His experience was not pleasant, although he uh, was a man of great accomplishment. And if he had been as unhappy as he claimed, I wondered, why didn't you transfer? Any school would have been glad to have you. Uh, it, it, Williams was what it was at that time. Uh, we didn't have a, a, a custom room down in the basement of the chapel. I only got two cuts a semester because I sang in the chapel choir upstairs. And I, of course, I was paid $75 a semester, which was probably a little thing at the time. <laughs> but but uh, all I'm saying here is that this kind of history has to depend on autobiography. I think that as all of us are individuals, and we're all entitled to our individual experiences here. Uh, I admire what it's become from our time. It certainly has come a long way since Frank's intensity. I think Ben Ben's has been very sensitive to the individualism of of experiences in the Jewish community at Williams across across the years. And he probably thinks I see that history too much through a religious uh, well, view. Um, I, have, I have responses to both. Um, <laughs> but I, I, don't, I don't know that I think that you, you see it so, so religiously. Um, I do think that um, your sense of what was necessary was informed by um, a specific perspective that's yours, um, and that that perspective had in turn been informed by those of others, yeah. uh, and you were not inattentive to a set of narratives at that <coughs> juncture yourself, right? Um, so uh, to, excuse, to sort of accuse you of a form of partiality is never my intent. Ra rather, to, to understand the dynamics of the form of reconciliation that I understood you to have been seeking, right? Now, to the question of autobiography, and this is very interesting, um, there have been those who've asked me if indeed I could write this kind of narrative, not having gone to Williams myself, not having access to memories of Williams in the, the, the 50s or 60s or 70s. And um, to that, one can simply say, please write, you know? Uh, please give us your narratives. Please give them to us in, in your voice. Let us, let, it, let us have them, right? Let us put them up against one another. Let us see the ways in which they correlate and the degree of discord between them. There shouldn't be a monopoly on being Jewish at Williams, nor should there be the reception of a work of history as though it ended a conversation rather than beginning one. He's supremely diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that the history of the Jewish community of Williams, until the time of the establishment of the Jewish Business Center, was a history that encompassed the struggle for individual Jews to find their ways into how to live at Williams. And that it today is this book which helps people resolve some of the problems that they have in their own self-analysis of their place of beliefs. Even today, when uh, many people have uh, an opportunity 
to most of this book, they have very, very different characterization of it. Some are very hopeful that uh, it will have uh, historical significance that matches the intent in doing this book. But the intent in this book was, as far as I can uh, tell, the uh, opportunity to show the institutional practices of, this, of the college and the effect they had on the Jewish population. But on the other hand, I think there's another tale of these whole books, and that is the tale of the Jewish population and their effect on Williams and, what their, and their effect on how they matured themselves as they grew old. And the <coughs> principle of assimilation was a principle that was drastically followed by many of the, the Jewish students in the 1950s, 1960s. But the question is, do those people who are assimilating them go back into the Jewish community or do they go out to the larger community? These are all questions that are raised by your book, which is also the good. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to just make a small footnote. I was uh, here with Stephen Sondheim when he was here, and to the best of my knowledge, he was a beta theta pi. Yeah, because he was. <laughs> now, there were some fraternities that had national quadrants that couldn't take Jews, but they took them anyway, and socially they, they, they couldn't give them a pin or a certificate, but socially they lived with the fraternity. And for all intents and purposes, we're members. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Bob Rubin, uh, I've only read half your book, so maybe you will resolve this in the half that I haven't read. But it, it seems to me that uh, President Oakley started off by saying that one of the, the focus of establishing this was as a Jewish religious center. And in looking at this, one of the, the core things that was going on at the time that may have kept Jews from fully appreciating their, their time here at Williams was the fraternity system, which has little or nothing to do with Jews, and with, uh, with religion. And then, as the Jewish Center having children here at the time that there was a Jewish Center, the Jewish Center, while it clearly had a religious focus, it also had a huge social focus. And what, what the, the question that I'm asking is, how, is that, how has that evolved over time, especially as the fraternities have disappeared, the fact that you stay in one residential house for, for three years has disappeared. And so one of the enduring uh, things about college life, at least for Jewish students, is you can be at the Jewish Center with all your buddies for three consecutive or four consecutive years. And so in, in many ways it takes the place, it replaces the same sort of brother and sisterhood of fraternities and sororities. And I apologize if you don't deal with that after the top part of that is read. <laughs> I'd refer that to Bob. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I well, quite agree. <laughs> yeah. um. you know, so the, the phenomenon, well, first of all, we have to understand in Jewish life that um, identity and participation uh, are, are more than just a ritual matter. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> well, uh, but, but that these things uh, intertwine in, in very important ways uh, so that some people have the, the appearance of ritual practices and devotion and other people seem to pass by that at a certain distance uh, without entering into that activity, but that it, it represents another kind of religious participation. So there, there is, you know, um, uh, without reviewing the whole pew uh, uh, study, uh, there's, there's such a wide range that we have, to be, um, we have to be moderate in the way that we understand what religious uh, means. But I think specifically to your point, and um, as, you know, a, a quite a newcomer to this in, environment, uh, only since 2004, 
uh, one of the things that I think is so important about the Williams College Jewish Association today and particularly surrounding the building is that when you come and encounter 120 or 130 people on uh, Friday night who come for Shabbat dinner, uh, many of those people uh, are not Jewish. And uh, that uh, Jewish students today at Williams feel comfortable bringing their friends to, uh, to Shabbat dinner. And that many Williams students who are not themselves Jewish are the ones who bring another Jewish student to uh, dinner at the, uh, the Jewish Association at the, in the building on Friday night. Um, literally what we have in that Shabbat observance is uh, a situation where the people who were once not very welcome at Williams are now the people who welcome the Williams community to the, the Jewish Religious Center. Uh, and uh, that, that uh, we understand the, the permeability of the community so that uh, this kind of openness and uh, uh, presence of many different kinds of activities in that, in that building make it anything but a place for exclusivity. It's a place where, uh, for instance, a Shabbat environment exists for those who really crave something very specific, where there's not television and radio and there's not uh, the people talking on their cell phones. Uh, and yet, it's a place which welcomes all kinds of people to share uh, in, in that environment and has a lot to do with the ways in which Jews are present throughout uh, the college today. Bob, could I add a footnote? It's, it's a little different. About four years ago, I believe, uh, Morty Shapiro asked me to chair a committee, student, faculty, administrator, to, to find a, a priest, um, a Catholic priest. And, um, you know, we went about our business, the, 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 there were various strains in the Catholic student community had to be overcome. But one thing that really hit me at the end of the line, we had three finalists coming up, and I'm, I'm out of it, so I didn't know who was to say. The allotment of space for meetings, an office does it here. And this is the non-liturgical space in the Jewish Religious Center, is assigned for other college uses. And that was stipulated when the building was built. So I found that we were interviewing these finalists, the Catholic chaplaincy, in the library of, of the Jewish Religious Center. I thought that was fantastic symbolism <laughs> for, for what Williams had gradually become. And I think it was r rather important for those finalists to see that. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's, that's just a further little complication. Uh, the, the Muslim chaplain was hired also after uh, an interview there. Uh, yes, and then. You know, ecumenism in the Jewish religious services uh, extended back, I'm a member of the class of 63, at the tail end of the compulsory chapel. And our Friday night services were populated by many, many non-Jewish students who wanted to fulfill their obligations. <laughs> I, I also made the connection between the Jewish Center and the Anjuman report, and Dr. Rogli is more probably more than coincidental that you were also on the panel last October uh, when the Andrew report was discussed. But when my son was president of the Jewish Association in 1991 or something when it opened, I explained to him that I saw this as an evolution originating from the Andrew report. And uh, it was uh, almost a fulfillment 
I want to uh, thank everybody for uh, making the effort to join us this afternoon, uh, and uh, to uh, I hope everybody has a chance to finish the book, uh, if you have not, and um, Ben will be spending a little time, uh, there's a reception uh, to which we're all invited uh, in the lobby. Uh, I want to uh, uh, remind people, because I forgot to say it at the beginning, that uh, this, uh, this occasion is facilitated by uh, the, the Oakley Center. And uh, uh, we're, we're grateful to them for their, their support and uh, making uh, this kind of, of, a, of a, an opportunity uh, available to us. Uh, thank you all for coming.